Hello and welcome to BMA 258 Services Marketing. Uh, this week we'll be dealing with chapter 5 in our textbook which is about distributing services through physical and electronic channels. And of course this distribution is the uh, place part of the extended marketing mix, so the P uh, place. Alright, now let's look at our learning objectives for today. So first of all, we need to list the four questions that form the foundation of any service distribution strategy. Uh, number two, describe the three main distribution options for servicing customers. Number three, explain the determinants of customers' as channel preferences. Number four, explain the issues of delivering services through electronic channels. Number five, describe the key roles of intermediaries in distributing services. Uh, number six, explain the special challenges of distributing services internationally. Uh, and number seven, describe the role of blueprinting in designing and distributing services. And blueprinting is going to be really important for us because we'll be doing that as um, part of our assessment tasks. All right, so first one is uh, distribution strategy in the, in, in, within a services context. So distribution is typically asso associated with moving physical manufactured goods to retailers distributors and wholesalers. However, in a service context, because services are intangible, we frequently do not have anything physical to move, right? So obviously distribution is going to be completely different. So experiences, performances, information, data and solutions are not actually being physically shipped or stored, yet um, distribution is still a key part of our marketing mix and we'll look at why. So. Uh, when we develop our distribution strategy, there's four key questions that form uh, the foundation of our service distribution strategy. The first one is what, second is how, third is where, and the fourth is when. And we'll have a look at those, how we answer those four questions in developing our place space, oh, no, I shouldn't say place space, but our distribution strategy. So the first one is what is being distributed. Um, so with sometimes we have information and promotion flow. So the distribution of information and promotion materials relating to the service offering to the market. And the objective in this case is to get the customer interested in actually buying the service. So although you might not traditionally think of that as a distribution mechanism, um, moving information around is still a part of a distribution. It's not as simple as moving things um, physically around, but, uh, but moving information and ideas is, um, is, is still part of that. All right, the other one is nego negotiation flow. So that's reaching agreement on the service features and configurations and the terms of the offer so that the purchase contract can be closed and finalised. Um, the objective in this case is to sell the right to use a service. Um, and for example, to sell a reservation or a ticket. When you buy a ticket online, you're not actually like even if you get delivered a ticket, like the bit of paper is not the value that you get. It's just, it just, it's just a display of your right to be able to um, engage in a service later on down the point. Um, same as when you book an airline ticket, uh, you'll get an email, you know, or with a PDF on there. That's not what you're really paying for. It's just a, um, um, it's just, a, it's just really a display of your right to be able to board that plane at that time. All right, now product flow. So many services, especially those uh, involving people processing or possession processing, require physical facilities for delivery. Um, so this is obviously a lot more like traditional marketing, um, um, where you know, like you get a haircut done, you still need to have scissors, you still need to have chairs. So all that, those tangible elements associated with that. All right, now let's distinguish between supplementary and core products. So it comes from this model here, and we've talked about this Lovelock flower of service before, but information and physical processes of the augmented uh, uh, service product. So in here, all these ones, so we've got ex uh, the billing, payment, information, consultation, order taking, these are all information processing parts of the, of, of the service, whereas there are exceptions kind of uh, safekeeping and hospitality uh, are the physical um, elements. Exceptions could be both really if you think about it. Um, uh, so when we're dealing with information processing, obviously distributing um, those is going to be a lot different than distributing uh, physical processes. And again, that's been published in this uh, research article here. All right, so let's go now. Th uh, the flow perspective on what is being distributed can relate to the flow to the core service as well as to the supplementary service and can link back to the flower of service model. 
information flow relates to the information and potentially consultation uh, pedals uh, and the product flow of the remaining pedals and core service. Uh, distinguishing between the core and supplementary service is important as many core services require a physical, physical location which severely restricts distribution options. <coughs> All right, so um, when you consider your service firm that you've chosen to do your service or run, I think you need to cl clearly analyze what your service, uh, what your core product is and then understand the distribution strategies around uh, involved in that. Now for someone like a barber, the distribution strategies for the core product are going to be different than for a lot of people who have chosen um, cafes and gyms and stuff like that. So each different service firm is going to have a different distribution strategy in how they do that and we can use this model to analyse that. Alright, so the next element is how should services be distributed. Now we've got six options of uh, for service delivery. So the top, and it's categorised by um, the type of interaction between the customer and the service organisation or the service firm and the ability of service outlet. So if the customer actually goes to the service organisation and the uh, availability of service out, uh, outlet might be a single or it might be a multiple site. So an example for a single site where the customer goes to the service organisation, so like a theatre or a hair, hair salon, like a hairdresser which we talked about. Uh, if it is multiple sites, it could be a bus service or a fast food chain. Now, I know some people are analysing fast food chains. Uh, just be a little bit careful because when, I ask, when those of you that have chosen to do Subway or McDonald's, we've chosen a specific store. So really, you'll be analysing it using a single site. If you analyse the whole franchise, it'll be multiple sites. Uh, now, the, the type of interaction is also the service organisation comes to the customer. When there's a single site, such as a house painting, where you get a registered painter that goes there and repaints your eaves and your gutters and stuff like that, or a mobile car wash. Or um, if it's got multiple sites, it could be uh, like a mail delivery or couriers and stuff like that, or uh, Uber Eats, something like that. Um, and then we've got a banking branch network where, uh, you know those, uh, <laughs> the, 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 cars, those little cars that the banks have and they send their lending um, consultants out to different people's houses and talk about mortgages and stuff. All right now the last one is um, customer and service organisations transact remotely. Now this could be a for a single site like a credit card company or a local TV station. Uh, for multiple it would be broadcast network um, or a telephone company in there as well. So um, like a broadcast network is obviously going to have uh, because it's a network, it's going to have, have different broadcasting things throughout Australia, whereas a local TV station just generally has one. All right, now let's look at how. So does the positioning strategy require customers to be in direct physical contact with its personnel, equipment and facilities? Now, there's three possible options, which we had before. The customer goes to the firm, the, the service firm goes to the customer, and the, and the customer and service firm uh, transact remotely. So we've sort of really... Uh, building on that. Now, for example, uh, this comes from the textbook, I believe. So, uh, this one uh, is, is, is the Car Concern Bank's mobile banking service is an innovative approach to how services are distributed. And they actually drive around, it's got ATM, and um, uh, the, uh, they, they can just, so on the weekend where there's like more demand for that particular spot, whatever, they can leave it there. I've also put in here the um, retail gravitational model. Now, I don't expect you to understand this formula. But I want you, I've put it in there because sometimes researchers, like marketing researchers or academic researchers, we use these types of things to predict if, if you're relying on the customer going to the service firm, uh, this is some of the analysis that we can do to predict uh, how many customers would come and what sort of demand we can expect from, from that. And where we place the firm, because if the customer needs to go to the firm, where we locate that firm is obviously going to be really, really important, right? Um, uh, whereas if the if the service firm goes to the customer, like the mobile banking places, uh, you know, obviously where the, where the, where the headquarters is, isn't so important because they're going out from there. Um, but when the customer goes to the, to the firm, where we locate that firm is really important. We use these models to help us with that. All right, now let's talk about uh, channel preferences and how they may vary. So the use of different channels to deliver the same service not only has a different cost implications for a service organisation, but it also drastically affects the nature of the service experience for the customer as well. So we have these interpersonal, impersonal and self-service channels. So uh, we think about the channel preferences. So some of them are complex and high risk services and these are usually uh, 
best done through uh, personnel channels. And that's because if it's complex, human beings are uh, you know, good at dealing with complexity. We can adapt to a, a complex and dynamic environment. So um, when, when the service needs to, to respond, um, people are good at it. Whereas machines, like you think of an um, ATM, like an automatic teller machine or something like that, um, uh, if, if the customer asks for something different, that, like the, it's just a machine, it can't respond to that, right? So uh, it's better to have um, person, personal channels in that. Now, uh, with customers with high confidence and knowledge, impersonal and self-service. And you think, well, why would somebody want an impersonal service? But it does happen. Now, think about something that you interact a lot with, and it's simple. You know what's going on. You don't want to be doing the, hi, how are you going? How was your day? How's the kids? Blah, blah, blah. Because it just takes time and emotional energy and stuff like that. So when these ones, the higher confidence and knowledge, are often um, fast and um, frequent interactions. And then we, uh, uh, like the, the time that we spend in it, we want to be easy to use and fast to use. Now, the value function aspect is about convenience. And this one is the impersonal or self-service. So, um, it kind of links a little bit with the high confidence and knowledge, but here it's about um, uh, not so much about the customer knowing what's going on, and that's so customer learning, but it's more about I want something really uh, functional. So think of a vending machine or something like that. So you don't need to have a lot of knowledge. You need some knowledge, but you don't need, a, you don't need a, a high degree of customer learning to be able to operate a vending machine, but it, it's a functional. I'll give you my money, give me my Coke type thing. Um, convenience is a key driver for channel choice. So when we're developing our um, channels for our distribution strategy, we've got to think about you know what's the most convenient to the customer. And of course, we've got to think about you know um, other things such as, as the efficiency and effectiveness of it. But uh, keeping in mind what's going to be convenient because uh, often we think oh well that's better for the customer, but if it's not convenient, it has a big impact on their consumer decision making process. All right, now let's look at self-service technology. So this sounds like a big word, we use SSTs. It's basically the self-checkouts, um, and we're all familiar with them because it's at Coles, it's at Woolies, it's at Bunnings, it's ATM, it's just, they're just everywhere, right? Oh, McDonald's now as well, those fast food um, outlets. So uh, now the determinants of customers' adoption of self-service technology, so there's a few issues with that. Um, First of all is the, so th these ones here, so the perceived usefulness and the perceived ease of use, they come from a, the technology adoption model uh, and these are the two antecedents that ha happen to link, uh, link into adoption, or not just um, self-service technologies but all types of technology, so it's quite a broad model. But the um, more useful the customers perceive the technology to be, the more likely they are to use it and adopt it and the easier it's perceived to be, to be able to use it, the more likely they are to try it and then adopt it as well and stick with it. Um, also perceived risk, we can see that a lot with services because it's so intangible, we're dealing a lot with risk throughout our, just, uh, throughout our whole um, marketing strategy. Uh, perceived control of our, over our situation, and this is the thing with social media as well. Uh, we've done research uh, about uh, organizations using social media and one of the big issues that um, businesses don't like using social media to interact with customers is because they feel like they're losing control over that communication process. Uh, perceived fun and that's hedonistic. So hedonistic is a big word. Um, basically it means how much fun you're having with it. Now so these are the characteristics of self-service technologies but there's also individual differences. Age has a big impact on the adoption of self-service technologies. It's probably no um, surprise that older people avoid it more. Um, and we've got some really cool research coming out of that because uh, when you do bring in self-service technologies into your um, uh, service firm, um, if we know that older people are going to have trouble doing it, what we do is we train up uh, our, our older staff and we get them to assist doing it. And what turns out when old people are reluctant to use these technologies, there's another older person they're telling them to do it, they're much more likely to adopt it. Uh, gender, I'm not sure how much this happens anymore but um, that could be one uh, education uh, like more educated people are usually the more open they are to new experiences uh, income as well uh, technology anxiety some people are just they're just technophobes they call themselves that like I know people uh, that are like I just don't like new technology I like doing things the old way uh, technology readiness and then need for human interaction one of the big complaints that we get 
from um, self-service technologies is that they feel like they're getting ripped off because part of the enjoyment of en of going through a service is interacting with the service staff. And when we, indeed, when we as marketing managers are training our staff to always be friendly and polite, um, you can see why they would they would enjoy that then because you know you, you you're paying for a service and you get that nice interaction as well. Whereas with the self-service technology, you miss out on that. Uh, some people love it, usually the extroverted, the social people. Some people aren't so keen on it, like more like the introverted and the um, more quiet people. All right, so where? Where are we going to do our distribution network? So uh, service delivery in a bricks and mortar content. So bricks and mortar, so you've got bricks and clicks. Bricks is like the, um, you know, like traditional retail, whereas clicks is obviously the websites and stuff, right? So bricks versus clicks, uh, we call them bricks and mortar. Uh, mini stores. So an innovation among many multi-site service businesses involves creating numerous small service factories to maximise geographical uh, coverage, such as like ATMs. So ATMs are actually physical things. Um, locating in multi-purpose facilities. So the most obvious locations for consumer services are close where customers live and work. For example, uh, Singapore's uh, Changi. I'm probably saying that wrong. Airports. This is a beautiful um, picture, and look at how green and stuff it is in there. Um, uh, so it's not just a traditional airport. So this airport's like a whole shopping, I don't want to say shopping center, yeah, why not? I like shopping complex. I won't say shopping center, I'll say shopping complex because it's a little bit different, right? But you get the idea. So if you are de delivering services, you can think about these um, uh, multi-purpose facilities. All right, so we've got uh, local constraints. Although customer convenience is important, the need for economies of scale is an operational issue that may restrict choice of locations. But that's why we don't get very many cool things in Launceston because we just don't have the uh, economies of scale, so the consumer demand to support that. Um, and for things to be uh, economically viable, they need to be able to scale to a certain size. All right, and we do, uh, uh, there's people like for these chain stores that look at different potential development sites and that's what they're looking at. How big can we scale it up to and, and are we going to be able to get a return on money for that? All right, so considerations for bricks and mortar distribution centers includes cost. Um, obviously, you have to lease or buy land in buildings. That's a massive cost. One of the cool things, are, um, though, is if you are a business, like your own business or a franchise, and you are buying land to put those uh, uh, distribution network in, um, land is often a really good investment too, right? So n not only are you investing in your business, but you're also investing in um, real estate. So that's that's a double whammy, which is not really talked about much in the textbook because a lot of big businesses just lease um, to keep their overhead costs down. But from my interactions with um, smaller businesses, it's actually a, a pretty cool um, side benefit. Right, customer convenience, I can't emphasize this enough. People often choose um, locations that suit them. That's bad. Choose locations that suit your customers. Uh, so customer preference and ease of access. Now, when should services be delivered? Now, traditionally, retail and professional services are available in the um, 40, or I should say 38 now, uh, 38 to, to 50 hours per week. Uh, this situational, this situation inconvenience, inconveniences some working people. Um, and I find that quite odd because um, I'll be working from just say, when I was running a construction business, I worked on site from just say seven o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. And then when I wanna to go to the bank, the bank will be closed. So I always have to do all these service stuff during business hours, but if, if you own a business that might not be suitable, if you work for a business, it's usually, because you have to take time off, like, so um, historically, uh, yeah, so, so my, my point there was that um, it inconveniences some people, so now service firms are looking at different modes of distribution and, and being available at different times, right, for that win. Historically, sun, Sunday training is uh, strongly discouraged by Christian cultures, uh, today, some highly responsive service firms are open 24-7, like McDonald's and Kmart and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, however, some firms uh, continue to resist the seven-day trading, um, which I think is, uh, is, uh, can be a really good idea, um, and use the being closed on Sunday as part of their value proposition. And uh, Chick-fil-A is an American store that's renowned for being closed on Sundays. Um, and uh, the idea of that is gives their staff, um, um, you know, that, that day of rest. Uh, obviously some firms don't have that like uh, hospitals and police stations and stuff like that um, you know you can't just shut the hospital down on Sunday <laughs> because um, you know people are sick all the time so some some services they just need that 24-7 coverage all right so I'm gonna end it there um, and then move into part two